everyone. We're so glad to be here. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. I trust you'll take your Bible and follow along. We're going to be beginning in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. many of you would like to be used by God? You'd like to be used in his service. You know, I believe that's the heart of every true believer. Deep down somewhere, we all want to be used by the Lord. Not all in the same way, obviously, but we want to have a life that, first of all, is dedicated to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we get saved in the first place, by believing that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. But after you're saved, do you want to be used now by the Lord? You know, there's a reason he saved each and every one of us, right? He didn't save us just to sit there like a bump on a log. He wants to use us. But we find in Scripture that he can't always use everyone. And there are reasons why that is so. And uh, by the way, for those of you who are regularly here, we usually are in Romans. We've been in Romans for how many years now? <laughs> and we're going to take a little break. We're going to talk about some of the, the characters. You know, we usually talk about the Lord Jesus Christ at this time of year, but we're going to center in on some other people that surrounded his coming. We're going to be looking at Zacharias, and uh, we're going to be looking at Elizabeth, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Mary and Joseph. So... These are, these are obviously some important people surrounding the birth of Christ. And we're going to look at some of the qualities that they possessed in order to be used of God. And in fact, we're going to see that if they did not have these qualities, God would not have been able to use them for that particular purpose. Now, God can always use us in some way or another. Someone has said you can always be a bad example. Well, no, we hope that's not the way that he uses you. But he can always use you in some positive way. But there are times when we might just disqualify ourselves for certain kinds of service. And we're going to see people here in our text, uh, two texts actually, in, in uh, Luke 1 and Matthew 1, that did not disqualify themselves. In fact, were very qualified to be used in the way that God wanted to use them. We're going to look at four qualities in particular. And first we're going to look at uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And the quality we want to highlight is their faithfulness. So let's pick up in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. The first thing I want to point out about these two individuals is that they were faithful in marriage. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, in the instance of Zacharias and Elizabeth, Zacharias was a priest. And we have to kind of back up in our thinking and our Bible understanding. This is taking place yet under the law of Moses. And when you said the Mosaic singers, I don't think that means they're no. They're singing about Moses. I think it's a, a mosaic, right? Okay, I, I want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but they lived under the law, and that's going to affect how we understand their faithfulness. But let's just look at the example that we find here. Uh, Zacharias, who, by the way, was the father of whom? Huh? I heard it. Oh, come on. <laughs> John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Good job. All right. Um, Zacharias, he was of the course of Abiah. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you go way back into 1 Chronicles, you'll find that God had instructed David to, King David, to divide the priesthood into 24 courses. And the reason that was done is because there were more priests than there were jobs to go around at the temple. And so you had to have certain priests come in at certain times. The, the course of Abiah was the eighth course down the, the list. 
and uh, that meant that he came at a certain time of year. Uh, but even within the priesthood, uh, we find that not everyone could come in. And we're going we're to talk about that a little bit later. How did they decide who gets to come in and be the priest? Because if you're a priest, you want to be used of God, right? And you would want to be able to come into the temple and minister there. And, and yet there wasn't enough uh, jobs for everybody, so they had to choose. We're going to talk about that a little later. What does this have to do with his marriage? Well, one of the laws that God had established for the Israelite priest is that he had to marry a woman who came from the priestly line as well. He couldn't marry just anyone. And so to be faithful to the word of God, he had to marry a particular line. And in verse 6, it says of these two, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now when Zacharias would have gone to court his bride, to choose a bride, he had to go to the right tribe, he had to make sure she qualified, and certainly he would have wanted a bride who was a believer. And I want to just make an application here that I think is so important. We've got a lot of young people here today. How many of you young folks are like 18 or under? Huh, raise your hand. Come on, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of them here today. Great. I'm talking to you, so pay, pay attention, all right? Who you marry is going to greatly affect how you may serve the Lord. Mark it down. You may think that really doesn't matter at this point. Believe me, it does. First and foremost, marry a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you wouldn't think we'd have to say that at church, right? You'd think we'd know that. And yet, many a Christian young person has married outside of the faith, and it really hinders the ability that they might have had to serve the Lord together. And so that is a very important point. And we see that here in this text. These, verse 6, these were both righteous before God. God. So they were faithful in their marriage. Secondly, Zacharias was, and both of them, Zacharias and Elizabeth, were faithful to God's revelation to them at that time. They were still living under the law. Now, we're not under law, but under grace. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 tells us. But they lived under the law. And what did that entail? Verse 6 again says, they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. In other words, they were faithful to that which God had revealed to them. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the technicalities of verse 6, but it's such an important verse. They were righteous before God, and it says walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Under the law, being righteous before God required that you have faith. We're not, he's not saying here they didn't have faith. But if you lived under the law and you had faith, what did you do? You walked in the ordinances and commandments of the Lord. Now today, we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. We're not saved by keeping certain ordinances and commandments of the Lord. That's not how it works today. But that's how it worked then and they demonstrated their faith walking in all those commandments and ordinances. And where did you put that, Ryan? I asked Ryan for water. It's been dry lately, at least for me, and I need to have a little sip here. So, All right. So they're faithful in marriage. They're faithful to the revelation God had given for their day. Thirdly, they were faithful in the face of discouragement. Look at verse 7. And when they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. I think I've asked this question here before. How many of you are well stricken in years? <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm right on the, the top of the hill. Starting over the edge and picking up speed. That's well stricken. But that meant she was, first of all, look, notice in verse 7, she was barren. That simply means she was unable to have children. Now, that's, that's okay. That's, that's, that's not something wrong with her other than maybe physically. Uh, but every 
Jewish woman, and I think every woman in general who's married desires to have a child. And so she was unable to have children. And now they're both well stricken in years, which would mean, again, in the natural realm, they wouldn't even be able to have children anyway because they're too old. And yet, they are faithful. And the point I want to bring out here is sometimes in life, we come across disappointments, things that didn't happen or did happen or something that went wrong. And sometimes people turn away from the Lord under those circumstances. And that's really a tragedy because that's when you need the Lord the most. And they were faithful, even in light of the fact that they were unable to have children but then a fourth way we see faithfulness, particularly in Zacharias, is that he was faithful in service. And I want to talk about that a little bit again in verses 8 and 9. He says, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this lot. The drawing of lots was God's way of directing Israel many times. Uh, back in uh, the Old Testament, it says that uh, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. So in other words, that's one way God used to direct his people in that day. Now, again, I will uh, warn you, that's not how he's directing people today. Don't, don't be drawn straws and picking lots to, to figure out what God wants you to do. That's not how he's doing it today. Today, his primary method is right here. It's in the Word of God. It's giving us instructions to follow. But uh, at that time, they drew a lot. And it says here that his lot was to, bring the, uh, to burn the incense when he offered that offering of incense. And if you know your Old Testament, you know that uh, there was a table of showbread and the candlestick, and then right before the veil that was within the temple, before the Holy of Holies, there was a, a little table where the incense was burned. And we're going to talk about what that meant here in a moment. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how special this position was to be able to even go into the temple. Not just anybody could come into the temple. Temple wasn't like a church building, okay? You didn't just come in there and sit down and worship. You only got to go in there if you were of the priesthood, and you only got to go in there certain times of year, and you only got to go in there if your lot was drawn, when it was your course, the course of Abiah in this case. And just to give you an idea of how rare it was to get to go in there, uh, how many of you have heard of the historian Josephus? Okay, Josephus lived around the time of Christ. And so he was very familiar. He was a Jew. He wasn't necessarily a believer, but he was a Jew. And he said this about the priesthood. According to Josephus, there were about 20,000 priests at the time that this took place in Israel. 20,000 in the whole country who were eligible. Now, you were only eligible as a priest if you were between the ages of 30 and 50 and you're in the right tribe, all of these things, there were about 20,000 people. Well, obviously, you're not going to have 20,000 people in the temple doing all of these things, right? And so you've got to divide it up. You have the 24 courses that we talked about. Each is on duty for two weeks out of the year. That would bring you down to 833 men who would have been qualified at that time to go in and offer this, this uh, in incense. Well, that's still too many, right? You're not going to have 800 guys going in and, and doing this. So now you've got to choose one uh, day by day. You divide 833 by 14 days. Each day there would be at least 60 men on duty to be eligible to go in and offer the incense. Okay, we've still got too many guys, right? Got to narrow it down. Then you come to the lot. You pull the lot. You, pull, you draw the name out of the hat, so to speak. And that's the one guy out of 60 who would have been eligible who gets to go in and offer the incense. Now, if you were a priest, do you imagine you would have wanted to be that guy, right? I mean, that, that was a special way that God used you. In other words, this was so special that it is said historically that once you got to serve in this capacity, 
Your name was withdrawn. You never got to go in there again. Wow. So here's Zacharias once in a lifetime. He gets a chance to go into the temple and he gets to offer the incense. Now the incense represented something. It represented prayer. Just as that smoke would waft its way up to the ceiling, that pictured the prayers. And if you go to the book of Revelation, it comes right out and says, the incense is the prayers of the saints. So it's talking about those prayers going up. Now, throughout Zechariah's life, he must have stood there, at least from the time he's 30 years old, he must have stood there many times and wondered if he would be chosen. And I'm guessing that he had a particular prayer that he wanted to bring when he got to go right into the temple and pray. Does anybody have any idea what he might have wanted to pray when he got into the temple? Huh? Hey, he would, he would want to pray for a child, right? And guess what? That's exactly what he did. We'll find that later in the text. Does this guy have faith? You know, we talk about the faith of Abraham. Now, he's well stricken in years. Technically, he would have been 50. I don't know if they were still holding to that at that time, but he's, he's old. He, uh, he's been holding this prayer in his heart for 30 years. He's probably been praying it, but now he's in the temple, right? You'd think that'd be a little better, a little closer, right? And he's going to go for it. He's going to, imagine the excitement. After all these years, he finally gets chosen. Look at verse 9. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without or outside at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. What prayer? And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. That's exactly what he prayed when he got that chance. He prayed for a son. And the, Lord, and the angel says, The Lord's going to answer that one. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him John. <laughs> Uh, God doesn't always do this, but sometimes he kind of like messes with people and gives them a specific instruction. You're going to do this. And to make sure you do this, you're not talking until John is born and named. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 14, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, and he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many, verse 16, of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make a people prepared for the Lord. And you know, that's what John the Baptist's job was, wasn't it? To prepare a people for the Lord, to prepare Israel for her Messiah. Verse 18, And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. He's got a little bit of doubt there, doesn't he? And yet he prayed. And the Lord sent an angel to give him the answer. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Faithfulness. Wow. Faithfulness in his marriage and faithfulness in his duties and in his, his obedience to the Lord. And, and God rewarded that faithfulness. Let me say to you this morning, don't let unfaithfulness keep you from being used of God. Don't let unfaithfulness keep you from being used of God. Now let's look at Mary. Mary exhibits two particular qualities that made it possible for her to be used of God. And I'll tell you, there are few people in human history who were used of God more than Mary. Would you agree with that? To bear the Messiah, bring the Messiah into the world. What a tremendous opportunity she was given. 
And yet, she had qualities that were required for her to be used of God in that way. And they are, she was pure and she was willing. She was pure and she was willing. Let's just look at those here in our text. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Mary was morally pure. Now I want to say something, and again, I'm going to address the young people, but I want to say something very clearly. If at some point you have become or become morally impure, it doesn't mean God can never use you again. But God required in this instance absolute moral purity for a couple of reasons. Number one, Christ had to be born of a virgin to escape the contamination of sin. Romans 5.12 tells us that sin entered into the world by one man. And that's Adam, of course, in the garden. And thus, death, sin, and death passed to all men. In order to come into the world as a perfectly pure human being, Christ had to enter the world through the womb of a virgin. Now that doesn't mean Mary was perfect, by the way. Mary was also a sinful person. She called Christ her son, her savior. She needed to be saved too. But by being born of a virgin, Christ escaped that contamination, which I'm sorry, fellas, is portrayed in scripture as being passed through the mail. And because he was born of a virgin, Christ escaped that contamination of sin. And he was thus eligible to die for our sins. If Christ had his own sins, he couldn't have died for ours. A second reason why moral purity was so important is because it fulfilled prophecy. If you go back to Genesis 3.15, after the fall of man and when God is giving each of Satan and Adam and Eve the consequences of what they had done, he told Satan, the serpent, that the seed of the woman would bruise his head. And again, that meant prophetically, Christ had to be born of a woman, not as a result of a woman and a man. And that's why Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So to fulfill prophecy, and besides, Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So in order to fulfill prophecy, Mary had to be morally pure. Don't let moral impurity keep you from being used of God. But another characteristic that Mary possessed was willingness. Look again in our text, Luke chapter 1, verse 28. It says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom 
there shall be no end. Now, obviously, this raises questions in Mary's mind. Verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And in biblical terminology, to know a man in this context meant she had not had sexual relations with Joseph. Even though she was a spouse, they weren't fully joined together yet. They were in what we would probably call an engagement, though it was much stronger than our modern engagements. How can this be? I have known not a man. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Now look at the response. Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary was willing. Now just think about that. Think about being Mary. Now some of you guys probably have a hard time doing that, I hope. But think about being Mary. And think of the scorn and the ridicule she would possibly face for now being found pregnant before her own marriage had been consummated. That would surely have been a very embarrassing situation at the very least, possibly dangerous, as we'll see in a moment when we look at Joseph. And the decision he had to make when he found out that his wife, his spouse's wife, his bride, was pregnant. She might have had the response, wait a minute here, I'm not so sure I want to go through with this one. But being the faithful young Jewish lady that she was, she immediately said, so be it unto me. Yes, I am willing. Don't let unwillingness keep you from being used of God. And there are many times people have not been used of God who could have because they simply were unwilling. I coined a phrase many years ago. Just remember, you heard it here first. In the ministry, I'll take willingness over talent any day. You just think about that. I'll take willingness over talent any day. Well, there's another individual we want to look at quickly, and that's Joseph, back in Matthew chapter 1. And the characteristic that stands out in Joseph's life is obedience. Obedience. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, or it was in this way, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now again, that's talking about the espousal. The way the Jewish marriage worked normally was the couple would become espoused, and then they would live apart for an entire year. And the main reason for that was simply to demonstrate that there was moral purity. They had not come together sexually before their marriage. And during that year, when the bride comes to the consummation of that wedding the year later, and she's not pregnant, and that would demonstrate uh, her faithfulness, her purity. And so it says during this espousal, before they came together, she was found with child. She's pregnant. Verse 9, 19. Then Joseph, her husband, and here's the key to this whole text, being a just man. Remember that. He was a just man. And not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, I understand from the Old Testament law, there were two choices that <coughs> Joseph could make under these circumstances. Number one, he could have her stoned. 
because the espousal was considered a valid marriage. And if she is pregnant, that means she has committed adultery. Therefore, under the law, she could be stoned. But it says, he was a just man and was not minded to make a public example of her. He didn't want to gather the town into the town square or wherever they did their stoning and have her humiliated and killed in that way. It says he was minded to put her away privily. And that was the other legal, lawful choice that he had during the espousal year if your wife was found to be unfaithful, you could divorce her under the law. And he was choosing that route. But notice in verse 20, but while he thought on these things, what love Joseph had for Mary. Now we know in modern Mideastern culture, a lot of times what choice would be made? Yeah, stoner. But he loved her. And he did not want to make a public example. And he was not hasty. But while he thought on these things. And you know, there's great value to taking your time when you have a major decision like this. I remember years ago serving in Wisconsin with our board there, and there was a a fairly weighty matter came up before the board, and the chairman of the board uh, led us in a discussion. We spent a lot of time talking about it, but instead of taking any kind of vote or making a decision, he said, let's still think about this one for a while. And again, it is so important not to rush into a decision when it's such a weighty matter, and this certainly was. And it's a good thing that Joseph waited because while he was waiting, verse 20 says, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We're talking about a big deal here, aren't we? And Joseph, being the obedient man that he was. Says in verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not. In other words, did not have relations with her. Till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, too, had that decision to face. Do I really want to go through with this? Look at the lifetime of misunderstanding, of perhaps ridicule, and we know it eventually came in the gospel according to John, when Christ, later in his ministry, was discussing his origin with the Jews, they self-righteously told him, we're not born of fornication. And I think they were clearly intimating that Christ was. That was the general belief. Christ was <coughs> born of fornication. Joseph surely thought of that scenario as he considered his decision, and yet, his choice was to obey God, even if it required a sense of humiliation at times. Don't let disobedience keep you from being used of God. You know, the good news that we have today is that God wants to use each and every one of us in some way shape or form and really many times all that hinders that is if we're unwilling if we don't want to obey if we've allowed impurities in our life rather than living for the lord it's really up to us god wants to use us why not make ourselves available to him
Well, these are wonderful testimonies, and it's amazing to find them in the context that we do, because at this time in Israel's history, most Israelites were only surface Israelites. Oh, they might have kept the laws, they might have made the outward form of righteousness, but by and large, they were lost. They were lost sheep. And yet, here are some shining examples in that time of otherwise apostasy in the nation who were faithful. They were obedient. They were serving the Lord. And they were willing to be used of God. Let's pray. Father, how thankful we are for testimonies such as Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. These older folks and younger folks of the the first century who at the very time of Christ who made themselves available for your service. Lord, I pray that we might have that same attitude and desire in our hearts and lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.